So Eric, thank you for making the time. We're, we're going to talk about a couple of Quillette articles that have come out quite recently um, talking about the IDW. And the first one was talking about whether the IDW is intellectually diverse and then a follow-up article as well. We're going to talk about some of the criticisms of the article, but I'd like to start, because I know that you're a fan of this tactic, by steel manning that particular argument. If you were to restate the argument in a, in a, in a way that you think is more accurate than was made, how would you do that? Well, I think that's a great question, David. I think that part of the problem is that um, there are a lot of different skines running through this discussion, and it's hard to pull them apart. One of which is that some people within the IDW um, are fans of the term classical liberalism. And I'm not necessarily for it or against it. It's just not a term that I tend to apply to myself. And I don't think that uh, sufficient care has been taken to say uh, that some members of the group or movement or what have you uh, use that label while others do not. And so there's a bit of a pressure at the moment to say, well, you guys all call yourself classical liberals. And I, don't, I just don't think that that's the case. Um, so that would be the, the first sort of steel manning is, is that uh, I would want the critique to be more careful um, about saying that it's limited to those who identify as classical liberals. And then the author has every right to try to make the case that the classical liberal position is in fact um, a version of conservatism. But I certainly don't think of myself uh, as a classical liberal first and foremost. I think of myself as somebody who has progressive um, conservative and libertarian feelings on a variety of different issues. I think that's why all of these positions continue to be uh, explored with none, no particular political viewpoint ever becoming dominant. Because if we're, if we're really truly honest with ourselves, um, when we say we're conservative or liberal or, or progressive or what have you, we're usually talking about kind of the leading note or tone that we are expressing. And I think that, um, you know, when people are incautious and they say, well, I am a staunch libertarian or I am a committed conservative, then what they're doing is that they're exchanging sort of a degree of resolution for a um, for degree, degree of clarity. And a lot of people appreciate that clarity on the front end. Uh, I pay a fairly heavy price by saying I'm not a free speech absolutist. I'm, I'm very much associated with free speech, but there are lots of ways in which um, I can't stomach certain kinds of free speech outcomes. For example, uh, child pornography is not something that I would stand behind uh, under free speech, far from it. You know, many of us pay a hefty price for uh, appearing to purists to be mealy-mouthed, if you will, uh, when I say that I'm not necessarily anti-tribal, I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, anti-progressive or, or pro-progressive or anything like that. So I, I suppose what I'm thinking is that uh, there's a, been a critique made of the wing, if you will, of the IDW, as if it was the totality of the IDW. And that wing is being faulted uh, in the minds of the authors and, and others for an insufficient layer of uh, level of resolution. And I think that those of us who paid a hefty price for saying, well, I'm, I can't be tied to an absolutist position on any of this stuff, um, really did so because we want to keep a very high level of resolution. And so I think that there's a series of trade-offs. There's no way of pleasing everybody. I think when it comes to what the article was trying to do and trying to say, um, there's, there's a further refinement. And that has to do with the fact that if you break progressivism or the left or, or whatever you want to call it uh, into the traditional liberal core of the left, and then uh, you augment that with a fairly recent, extremely aggressive upgrade, which appears to be willing to attack reason, civility, 
as agents of oppression, you know, or tools of oppression. Um, I think that that upgrade is really what is it at issue and a question, what is it, what is being questioned? And if you believe that, that upgrade, that extremely postmodern um, adjustment to classically progressive positions, if you think that is now the new dominant left and it's not going away, you probably take a fairly dismissive attitude towards the entire left of center uh, canon of thought. And I would say that there are members of the, of the IDW who believe that uh, this current aggressive strain has displaced classically liberal or classically progressive positions, uh, which will never return and that we now need to deal with the fact that that upgrade uh, is permanent. And those people have probably um, decided that they are going to abandon any hope in a left of center position. Well, if I held that position that that upgrade, if you will, that marginal difference um, in a level of aggression and willingness to attack reason and data and evidence and itself in favor of tying people in knots logically and epistemologically, um, if I thought that was permanent, I would understand exactly why these people were completely abandoning any kind of uh, high resolution view of the left. Now it happens that I understand why they're saying that, but I disagree. I believe that many people are fairly moderate and liberal in their views and are going through a period uh, akin to the McCarthy era, which I've called left Carthyism, in which it's very dangerous to simply say the obvious, which is when you're attacking reason or one of two genders or uh, concepts as abstract as patriarchy or anything like that, you probably made a fairly significant wrong turn somewhere um, in your thinking. And while it might be too difficult and too dangerous for most people to uh, explore their own relatively moderate left of center positions. Um, I don't think that the reasonable left or the analytic left or the traditional left has gone away. I just think that it's been terrorized uh, into a sort of hibernating state. And I think that's a, that's a major difference between the sort of right-leaning um, portion of the IDW and the more left-leaning portion of the IDW. And I think, you know, it, I may disagree with the people who are in the more right-leaning portion, but that's what makes that's what makes it interesting. Certainly, why I'm listening to them and saying, "Hmm, you really think this is permanent? You think this is never going back?" Now, what's what's very new, if I understand it correctly, is that Claire is suggesting that we are caricaturing the left. This is Claire Lehman, uh, the Quillette editor. Correct. Yeah. That uh, Claire and her author Yuri. Uh, who she's publishing, are making the point that we hear frequently that the new upgrade to the um, sort of left orthodoxy, uh, it's not that it's new in terms of uh, nobody's ever heard it before, but it's never been as dominant uh, to my way of thinking as it is now, that that upgrade probably has more to it than we, we would imagine. And I think we're very interested to hear why Claire believes that. We definitely believe that people are discounting too much of what is going on on the left. I and mean, the left has had a tremendous number of huge successes with gay marriage or cannabis legalization um, and, uh, you know, greater awareness, let's say, of uh, gender fluidity issues. I think that these are all things that, you know, are long in coming and uh, are super important. And I think that, that they are um, sort of representing the, the best qualities of the left. The question of whether the new highly aggressive strain uh, has something new to say, that's really, that's fascinating. I, I was kind of unaware that Claire believed that. Um, so if the idea is that viewing everything through a racial lens and um, you know disputing whether or not uh, lived experience trumps uh, any kind of objective of, uh, experience. Uh, if that is, in fact, some sort of an innovation, I'm pretty aware of it. Um, 
And I've heard this a lot. I, I've heard that these ideas are now uh, carrying the day on the left side of the aisle because they represent some understanding about the limits of rationality. And uh, that's one hell of a meeting I seem to have missed. And just to sort of also steal man a little bit um, from, from my side, it talks about the, the dividing line now, and I think there's, there's some truth in this, that the, it came from an original tweet that seemed to show that the, most of the members of the IDW were liberal on most issues. And Uri said, that just feels wrong. And his, his idea was that the dividing line now I think this is certainly true online and probably started with, with Gamergate and has kind of developed through then, is that the dividing line now is whether you are pro or anti uh, what you might call social justice activism, is kind of characterized as social justice warrior thinking. That, that is now become a big dividing line, hasn't it? Well, I mean, I, I think this is, this is very mysterious. I think a lot of us have traditionally had a very positive view of social justice. Um, it's the warrior part, this kind of vigilantism that we're having none of. I mean, I think all of us are having none. And the, you know, the, the, just sort, the sort of glee with which people are, are talking about canceling human beings and ruining lives and really excited about the idea that no platform will be given to or relatively moderate positions as if um, uh, garden variety country club Republicans or even liberal Democrats uh, are one step away from Joseph Goebbels. I mean, that's the, that's the really weird stuff that I don't think anybody has any patience with at all because it's just not part of adulthood. Because some people would say that that is is a caricature, and most people on the left don't believe those those things. That there are far more reasonable people to have conversations with that won't that wouldn't kind of degenerate into reason is a tool of the capitalist patriarchy, or that that's a caricature of a very small part of the left. Well, then here's the question: Why is it? that this moderate, reasonable left doesn't tell these shrill voices to shut up. They're terrified. The children are wilding, right? The adults are cowering behind their front doors because nobody wants to be doxxed. Nobody wants to find that they're unemployable. Nobody wants to be shamed. Nobody wants to be canceled. Nobody wants to be called out. I mean, look, th this is an uninteresting point. It has to do with the fact that what is now fueling journalism is outrage. And there's nothing more outrageous than publishing a story like, um, I can't be friends with white people anymore, or I, I divorced my husband because he was white, or uh, do men deserve to be in government at all, or something, you know, you, if you publish something like that, you, you get a lot of clicks because it's, it's, it's bananas. It's just, we're, we're going through a business model shift, and um, the baby boomers are in decline, their narratives don't work. We've got serious economic problems. We're trying to roll up our sleeves and come to common purpose. We've spent way too much time denigrating anything that smacks of patriotism as if all patriotism was jingoism. Um, we're deranged as, as the developed world has become deranged. The idea that our supposed elites who are anything but, believe me, I've met them, uh, can't figure out why, um, Brexit passed. They can't figure out why Hillary Clinton lost. Really? You can't figure out why, if you've called every single person who's a restrictionist a xenophobe, which they absolutely aren't. Most people who are restrictionists are xenophilic. Um, it's just based on epithet, fear, terror, shame, misportrayal, and it's endlessly boring. 
And Yuri said in his article that the big dividing line was on the attitude to structural oppression. And so, for example, do you, you, you identify as on the left, do you, do you believe in structural oppression? Do I believe that Robert Moses configured New York uh, as a planner uh, in order to um, you know, keep certain parts of the city from having falling land values or to keep uh, the races separate? Do I believe that structural oppression exists? Any smart person does. I don't even understand the point. Well, that was Yuri's point in his article where, that the major dividing line at the moment is whether you believe or take into account structural oppression. No, no, no. But, Yuri's but, just but, confused. <laughs> Yuri's out of his depth, in my opinion. Structural oppression exists. Everybody knows that it exists. I don't think anybody is seriously disputing whether structural oppression exists. We're debating what the degree of structural oppression is. So, you know, as I've frequently uh, pointed out, you have, I think, of the top 100 chess players, uh, 99 of them are male, one of them is female. Do you believe that 100% of that imbalance based on shares of the population versus shares of the top 100 chess players is all structural oppression in a game that doesn't seem to know which gender is playing? Well, I'm, I'm open to the idea that there's some structural oppression, sure. But do I think that it's 99 to one? Like, you know, is, uh, is chess the most bigoted, the most ferociously backward game in the universe? Uh, which is systematically um, destroying the lives of uh, female hopeful chess players. I don't even know what pathway I could imagine that that was taking place through. So I think what we're debating is people who are gleefully claiming that all imbalances um, are structural oppression if they do not favor uh, particular groups. And he referred to um, an Ezra Klein article in the first piece where Ezra Klein talked about the reactionary right online. And mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to pull apart because in some ways, and as you've, you've said, that the IDW is in reaction to certain things, which we can argue about whether it should be in reaction to or not. But how does it avoid becoming a purely reactionary movement and not saying okay there are certain ideas we need to resist but there's also a place on the other side of this where we can resolve some of these divisions look i think this is just a very stark cultural difference uh do you believe that the claims of structural oppression have skyrocketed in fact because oppression has never been lower than it is currently and people who need a high level of oppression in order to continue to claim special privileges are amping up their claims that the only reason that imbalances continue to exist could be structural oppression. If that's your perspective, and I think we've seen this with the Southern Poverty Law Center, that a group that many of us have very positive memories of, um, you know, they've got uh, a brick and mortar presence, they've got a large endowment and there are very few Klansmen to hunt. So it's probably a matter of political economy that you would expect that they would be looking for enough structural oppression to justify their ongoing um, commitments and operation. Now that's one perspective. Another perspective is, gosh, we, we got rid of all of the, um, ostensible causes of oppression and look at how imbalanced things continue to be. Ergo, it must be cryptic structural oppression and we have to you know, triple our efforts to hunt it out wherever it is. I think that would be um, closer to the experience of those who disagree with the IDW. And I think that that's a de debate that I would be interested in having with um, people on the other side who subscribe to the same rules of debate I do. I think one of the places where this has gotten entirely bizarre is that many of us are encountering the claim that reason itself and civility itself um, are tools of oppression. And then as soon as we make the observation that we've encountered such claims, somebody says, oh, come on, nobody really believes that. 
I, I cannot figure out what is going on in the uh, extreme left in terms of good faith argumentation. It's almost like a giant prank that never ends. In both of the articles, there seems to be quite a focus on Dave Rubin in particular. Why do you think that is and what do you make of it? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think we've all tried to figure out why we're going through this very bizarre time. I think Dave's view of how he is balancing his portfolio is that he's accepting a lot of very conservative gigs, for example, with Turning Point USA or PragerU uh, or going on Fox. And then his feeling is that he's balancing it by saying, hey, do you realize you guys just invited a gay man who smokes weed into your group? And uh, kudos to that for being tolerant. So from his perspective, yeah, he's doing a lot of work with conservatives, but he's constantly reminding them that they are changing and that they are becoming more tolerant. If you, want, if you like, his view, I think, is, is that he is making the, the right more liberal. Now, from a different perspective, and, and this is held by many people, he is choosing repeatedly to punch uh, to the left and to accept right-wing speaking engagements, you know, right of center speaking engagements. And so from that perspective, well, then he's just really uh, much more on the right. And I think that he's agreed that he's moved right. I don't think that's a question. Um, but I think it has to do with whether or not you view his balancing of this, which is, you know, he's quite open about um, talking about being pro-choice at a conservative event. And that is a way in which he is actually taking the left to the right as he fights the part of the left that he thinks has, uh, has taken the left down. And, you know, I don't think he makes any bones about it. He doesn't think the left is ever coming back. I think he thinks the Democratic Party is finished. So, you know, that's a debate that he and I have. I don't think the Democratic Party is finished. I think that we have to fight for its soul right now. And so... That's what, what I think is, is sort of dividing people, is, is that Dave's rhetoric and Dave's strategy is different than my strategy. So, you know, do I like Dave's strategy better than my strategy? No. You know, I, I, don't, I think he's uh, doing something where he's, you know, going on more conservative programs than I would feel comfortable with. And one of the issues that I see is that a lot of the criticisms of the left, and I'm thinking particularly of, of Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson, possibly because they're repeated so often, they seem to be quite low resolution. And do you, yeah. do you, do you agree? And do you think we need higher resolution critiques of the left? I, I think I'm going to be making higher resolution critiques of the left because I haven't given up on the left. If I were where they are, where they think this has just gone um, you know, metastatic and there's no saving it, uh, I think it's understandable why they would move to a lower resolution picture. Uh, I think that the, the real fear that I have is, is much more on the right, that we had the right down to a couple of uh, zealots with tiki torches, and now the far left is going to antagonize um, ordinary human beings to moving farther and farther right to, to escape an attack on reason and civility uh, themselves. So I think that this is a stylistic difference, it's a difference in findings of fact, I think that I am I am much more optimistic that this will bounce back and that we're in a period of madness and that the madness can't continue forever. But if I thought the madness were, were going to continue forever, sure, I might, I might just dismiss the whole thing. And I guess by higher resolution critiques, what I'm also thinking about is, as far as I understand, people only generally change their minds or even people only generally listen to you when you validate their experience in terms of, for example, say to someone on, on the left, your concern about unfairness is a valid, is a valid concern, but I'm, concern, I'm also worried about how that can turn into an ideology that then doesn't admit, uh, becomes very simplistic or whatever. I mean, that's, that's what I would consider a more um, nuanced perspective. What would you say is the nuanced perspective that needs to be made? Look, I've been trying to make this with Yuri to very little avail. 
he wants to say there's more to the le the position of the left than we are giving it credit for. My point is, I I've always believed that right that the standard liberal left uh, has a lot going for it. Um, the the progressive left, the, the the traditional progressive left, has had a lot going for it. The new upgrade, to my mind is where the real problems begin and end. And so what I'm really interested in is be, be hyper-specific. What is it about the glee with which we are canceling people? We are terrifying people. We are coming after livelihood. We are trying to humiliate, shame, and embarrass people so that they are terrified to speak out relatively garden variety truths. And then um, when they express fear, we say, oh, come on, nobody believes those really radical things. Maybe it's a few college kids with green hair somewhere in the Northwest, but man, are you overreacting? I, I think this is what's coming across as gaslighting. I mean, if, when you say open borders, do you mean open borders? If you don't mean open borders, don't say open borders. If you mean open borders, let's play through the consequences of what you're talking about. You know, if, if you really believe that every deviation from the percentage in a population, um, you know, are you really bothered by wage gaps? Is that really what's bothering you? Because I can tell you that in uh, high fashion modeling, uh, I think it favors women by like 10 to one. So men are getting paid 10 cents on the dollar. I don't think anybody seriously cares about that except as an oddity. And I don't think anybody's mystified as to why it's happened. Um, the key problem is, is that we've adopted these very strange speech patterns, like hashtag kill all men. Well, what do you mean by hashtag kill all men? Oh, I just mean that it would be nicer if the world were a little better for women. Well, I don't know. It's some, some pattern of English usage that, uh, you know, I think, I think the, the appeal of it and the fun of it is to get grandpa to scratch his heads and say, wow, kids today. And... There is also the point being made that the IDW needs to broaden beyond uh, where it currently is and to move to have more conversations with people, what reasonable leftists or people outside the kind of anti left left wing bubble. You think that that's true? You think those kind of conversations need to happen? I'm just mystified by this. I mean, if, if, if you've got Brett Weinstein in your group, he seems to me to be pretty far to the left. Um, I don't think Ben Shapiro is afraid of having a conversation with Brett Weinstein. I think that's not what the issue is. The issue is, do you want to have a pseudo conversation with somebody whose major point is to tar you as a bigot? Like, why would a boxer want to get into a ring with a gang member carrying a switchblade. I don't get it. It's not about boxing. It's just about violating the rules and uh, thinking that that's clever and cute. So, you know, to the extent that somebody wants to agree on the rules, they're probably not going to be representing the social justice uh, or perspective. I mean, I don't even want to use, the, use it as an epithet. But if the person's point of view is, I want to use um, something other than reason and civility with which to talk to you because those are the tools of oppression. We don't even know what a conversation means. I mean, David, I, I just think you have to appreciate this is a giant waste of time. It's a pathetic squandering of political opportunity to do good for, for the very people we're um, we're talking about whether that's trans people, poor people, people of color, traditionally marginalized groups. Um, you know, what we're talking about is trying to antagonize the far right into four more years of Donald Trump or something far more extreme. That's how it looks to me. The only reason that I'm finding this interesting is, is that I don't think it's interesting to torch the entire developed world on utopian social engineering experiments uh, run by out of control, uh, as if psychotics. It's, it's just not a fitting uh, end to the incredible experiment that is Western civilization, which has finally come to terms with all of its problems and all of its benefits. 
you know, whether that's, you know, the advent of antibiotics or, or slavery um, or Jim Crow uh, or nitrogen fixing. I mean, there's just some problem with stupid being in charge. This, David, this has gone on way too long and it's too weird and it's too creepy and it has to do with the political economy of the baby boomer Davos, whatever you want to call it, bubble collapsing and pretending that this is actually some sort of a, a, uh, an interesting intellectual left-wing movement with important points with people who can, um, who can make those points uh, in an intelligent fashion without name calling. I haven't seen it. Most of the things that people are saying that are reasonable were part of the left before the current increase in vigilantism. And if there's a new part of this, you know, all of this identitarian stuff, the intersectionality. Intersectionality was much more interesting when it was uh, Crenshaw, um, where was it, UCLA Law back in like the 1980s. You know, maybe, maybe uh, unpacking the knapsack and then the examination of unearned privilege uh, coming out of Wellesley was initially interesting. But it, it's, it's metastasized uh, into some kind of a cult-like thing and nobody... It's not, cults aren't interesting because you, you're just dying to understand them. They're interesting because they've got your children and your future hostage, right? And you just want, you want your family back and you want to start working on real issues, real problems. You don't want to be afraid to simply observe what you see with your own eyes and ears and report on it and be told, uh, you know, the, you're the love child uh, of Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and Pol Pot or something.